Well, hello, everybody, and welcome along to another We Happy Few 506 podcast, The Nearly Men, and I can nearly not contain myself with excitement. I am going to introduce my co-host, Doug Allen, uh, but I just got to skip to the main event. We are so happy to have our guest on today. It is the one and only executive producer of Band of Brothers, executive producer of the Pacific Head Hon Show at Disney, won Wimbledon in 2018. It's the one and only Tony Toe. Tony, I might have got that last bit wrong, Tony, but it's fine. We'll keep it in. Tony, how are you, my friend? I'm good. How are you guys? It's so good to see you guys. Oh, I'm great. Thanks so much. Actually, I do have a slight disclaimer. I was talking to Doug about it beforehand. Um, I scolded my foot. You know, I, you've got kids, Tony. Yeah? No. No, nope. you don't. Okay, well, you know kids then. <laughs> no, you guys are my kids. Right, well, so you know actors. All right, so imagine an actor is nagging you, okay? And I'm sure you've had this a billion times. And your faculties go First nagging you? <laughs> <laughs> to never. get something out of you, Tony? Totally? Never. Like, never had that before. <laughs> so my daughter was nagging me as I was mucking around with scalding water, and I poured it down my sock instead of into a cup. And I've given myself really bad burns, um, which is bad. I was going to have a graft, but actually they, I managed to not get a graft. But what they did do is they gave me some high-strength coding tablets. So I may have written these questions on high-strength coding, so I apologise in advance if they're either <laughs> prosthetic <laughs> or there's one too many things about Pink Floyd that have got nothing to do with it. Okay, so I apologise. Oh, um, let's just... Let's just talk about Pink Floyd. We love that. <laughs> <laughs> my, my son is called Floyd. Um, I love Pink Floyd. Um, right, so I've skipped over the fact that you're slumming it with us. Um, my first question to you, Tony, I've heard off the grapevine that you have a pretty incredible origin story in the business. Is that true? How did you start out in the business? <laughs> <laughs> Who told you I had a pretty great origin story? You see the um, thing that says Leighton there? It was, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was it's wrong, producer. he's in trouble. <laughs> you know, um, I finished drama school. I came out to Los Angeles. And I started working for this talent agency called the guy. Well, I should, probably shouldn't name the agency, but I was a little agency on La Brea and um, after working there for a few months I discovered that it was really a front for the mob <laughs> oh this is awesome <laughs> and how did you discover they, that um, <laughs> anyway they, 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 it was, uh, they were in real estate they were in beauty pageants uh, they were thinking about putting a, a, a ship offshore of L.A. to do a casino. Wow. Oh, that sounds a bit morbid. I'll be honest. I'm, I'm probably going to get killed for this. Um, <laughs> anyway, they were lovely to me. And um, they had me draw up plans to do a, a modeling agency. There were only three big modeling agencies. Still are now. Um, and they thought it could be competitive. And they were prepared to put a lot of money behind it. So I spent about a year doing that. And I thought to myself at the end of the year, wow, this isn't this isn't really what I signed up to do. I, I came out to make movies. And so I went back to the East Coast and I met with some very nice guys. And I said, look, uh, I hope you don't put me in cement boots, but I, I really have to get back to what I really wanted to do. And I came to L.A., so here are all the plans. Here's all the work that I've done. And please, uh, uh, if you'll excuse me, uh, I'm leaving. <laughs> and there was a little pause. And the guy slides over a business card and says, you ever have any union problems? Give me a call. And that was that. <laughs> <clears throat> so you got away lightly, basically. Yeah. I came back here and... Um, I worked on a, an AFI short as a PA and became a coordinator. Didn't know anything about filmmaking. And, you know, people would come in and say, oh, the gaffer wants this. And I'd go, gaffer? Uh, oh, the, the key grip wants that. And I'd go, key grip? Uh, <laughs> but I learned that really quickly. And then from there, I got a, a, a PA job on a low-budget horror series called Tales from the Dark Side. 
Oh, I remember that. That was really good. Tales from the Dark Side. <laughs> Tales from the Dark Side. See, I can do that. I can smush up to an exec producer like anybody else. Uh, <laughs> so then what happened then? Uh, I did that for about a year as a PA and became set. The, the first season I was a, this graduated to set PA. Then I went off and um, helped a producer uh, who was putting together a film. And he didn't have anybody to help him. So I did everything, scheduling, everything. I learned movie magic. I learned budgeting. I learned all that stuff. And he got the movie off the ground. And it was directed by Larry Gross, who wrote 48 Hours uh, of that wow. fame. Yeah. And it was a movie called 315. And on that movie, I learned everything. And I was assistant location manager. And that's really when I knew I wanted to do this. Because three in the morning, I was standing out, out in the cold, in the dark, waiting for the trucks to roll in, with a hot cup of coffee. It was freezing. It was a bad part of town, too. And then when the lights kind of appeared through the kind of dark, I got all excited and chills, and I knew this is what I wanted to do. And what went so before all this, you went to drama school. So was your intention to be an actor before this or? No, what happened was <clears throat> I was pre-med. And um, wow. I started going out with an actress. Oh, no. <laughs> who was in the drama department. <laughs> oh, no. I fell out of love with the actress, stayed in love with drama. I, I love directing. Mm. And so I stayed in the drama department and predominantly did focused on directing. Right. Well, you got to do everything else, right? And um, after drama school, they wanted me to go to graduate school for theater, for uh, directing at Columbia. And I, I, I kind of went, oh, uh, I want to go make movies. Oh, no, was there a prejudice? Was there a prejudice there because he wanted to make movies, not theater? Because there really is in England. Um, you know, I think there was, but I, I always knew that I was fascinated by the movie industry and that's what I was going to do. And, and I had passed up the opportunity to go to Paris to study with Peter Brook. Wow. Wow. So, uh, I just kind of drove West and took my chances. I didn't know anybody, didn't know anything about the movie industry and some people were very nice and kind and sweet and generous to me. And I made my way through because of that. That is a wonderful story, Tony. And that <laughs> story is completely different to the one that I had heard, which I'm not going <laughs> to <happy. laughs> I want to know your version. No, it sounds much no, more interesting than mine. Weird. I was like, that can't be right. So I asked you anyway, and I got something completely different. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Over a beer at Michael Cudlitz's house, I'll tell you the story I heard. And it, I can't wait to hear that. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. So, obviously, you know where we're aiming. We're aiming to get us to the Band of Brothers. So, what's the what's the interim between, I mean, uh, Earth to the Moon? Is that when you first started to work yeah. with those, those guys? Um, yeah. What was your role on that show? Well, um, there was a there was a one season series that I did for Steven, for Spielberg, called Earth 2. And that was a really tough, complicated, expensive show for NBC. And then, um, and then I did some other things. And I had... Uh, I was on a movie that I didn't want to do. It was the first time I ever quit a job because of the politics. And um, I didn't have anything else, but I quit it anyway. I, I, I replaced myself. I quit the movie. It's a big movie that was successful for Warners. And I got a call from HBO saying, hey, we heard you're loose on the streets. And I said, yeah, yes, I'm available. So, <laughs> Do you still know those mob guys? We've got a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good news is we have a project that's Tom Hanks. Bad news is we can't figure out how to do it. Can't figure out how to tell the story because it's so expensive in its current version. 
And so um, I, uh, I said, great. What, what do you want me to do? Yeah, we want you to come on. And I said, uh, I, I think I have to interview for her for it with Tom. He's the executive producer. I don't want to come on as the HBO guy. Mm. And so um, I went to interview with Tom and sure enough, first thing Tom said to me was, Tony Toad, what's so great about you that HBO wants me to take this meeting? I said, oh, I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say to them? What do you say? What, what, what's your comeback? I'm sorry? What's I said, look, I'm, 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 I'm not the HBO I'm here to audition I'm here to interview you you can decide if you you want to hire me I'm not being hired by HBO you're the one who's going to hire me or not and so we had a, a chat for about an hour and at the end of it he said okay let's go tow <laughs> and <that> was- wow <laughs> and that that was um earth to the moon yes that was from the earth to the moon yeah can we get a um, can we get a hat for Tony that says "Let's go toe" on it? Can we put that into that <laughs> one, please? Should make a T-shirt. It's a great T-shirt. <laughs> Let's go toe. <laughs> and then and then after that experience, because that was 1998, I think, wasn't it? And yeah. then Band of Brothers, obviously, you work with him again. How was that approach made? Uh, well, I I I I think that. Tom and Stephen had 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 different books by Stephen Ambrose and they had teamed up. And I think that they were, you know, Tom had Plato with Gary and they were proceeding and I had gone off and sold a series called The Harsh Realm to um, Chris Carter, who, who was the creator of X-Files. And so we had got that off the ground and I was actually in a wheat field in Canada directing an episode of Harsh Realm when the phone rang and Tom said, and, and I, I said, Who, who's this? And, he's, and, I, and there was a voice on the other end that said, Tom X. And I said, Tom. <clears throat> Says, he said, what are you doing? Said, uh, 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 I'm, I'm standing in the middle of a wheat field directing. And he said, Well, get your ass back here right now, because we just got the Bible for, for Ben, and and we need some help. And I said, uh, 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 I'm on a, I'm on another show. And he said, No, you're not. And I said, uh, Okay, I'll figure it out. <laughs> and so I extracted myself from. I mean, it's Tom, right? And Stephen, yeah. right? What do you? Say? So I extracted myself from um, my commitments at Fox and on Harsh Realm, and they were very generous and kind to me. And off I went back to LA because uh, we were shooting in Canada, <clears throat> and um, that's when I got involved in band. And uh, there was a Bible by Eric Jenderson by then, so. We got to work and, you know, we added all of the other writers and talked about what, you know, it needed to shape up to be. And and that's how uh, I got on Banner Brothers. I had a question <clears throat> about executive producing. Um, yeah. And because people think they know what that means. I think I know what it means, but I don't think I do. Um so if you're on a show as big as that, um, with all these departments and all this, just this the transport and the armories and just everything involved, and then all the, as they say in sports, big personalities involved as well, um, what is, the, what, other than steady in the ship, uh, is the executive producer often the arbiter of the compromise or what, where, where do you find yourself as, as what's your, what's your, what's your skill set and how did you learn it basically? Yeah. I, I, I think what we do is a people business, right? 
we we have to understand filmmaking and all of the components that go into filmmaking what a production designer does what a key grip does what a gaffer does <laughs> um um you want to be able to understand everybody's job in order to create an environment and an atmosphere that allows them to do the very best of it. I'll give you an example. Unlike a lot of movies or a lot of series, you you guys know this because you were on it, there were no stunt doubles for any of the characters. None, ever. You guys did everything yourselves. It was largely made possible by Joss Williams, who passed, God bless him. But Joss, who was special effects, really figured out all of those explosions and bullet hits so you guys could do it yourselves, right? right. Um, Simon Atherton, the armorer, made sure that you were weapons trained so you could use and load and do all of the things that you needed to do realistically, right? You know all of this. Mm -hmm. So it is really gathering all of these department heads, interpreting what Tom and Steven's vision for the piece was and facilitating it, knowing mm -hmm. what the components of filmmaking is and understanding that at the end of the day, all of that stuff, all of the production design, all of the special effects, all of the cinematography, all of the lighting, all of that is to put you guys in that environment. So you guys don't have to imagine anything. Mm. Then for you to be who your characters were. Mm. It's and an that's the most important thing because without you guys, what we have is just a beautiful empty frame of production design and lighting and explosions. Mm. But you guys breathe life into it. And that's what we're watching. Mm. You're watching you bring those characters to life. Mm. Yeah, interesting. So, so you 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 were you were sort of tasked with assembling all of the the heads of department, of which there were many, and there had to be obviously everyone. It was one of those projects, almost like a once in a lifetime project, where I know Matt and I definitely got the sense when we turned up that everyone was at the top of their game in every department. Yes, and was, and was it? How how was it managing managing them? Was it as Matt says, like a sort of a tale of compromise? Was there were, were you constantly having to sort issues out on a daily basis, or was you able to kind of let people kind of run and trust them with their? Because it's such a there's, there's a huge amount of money at stake and two huge names at the head of it. I mean, was it quite a pressured environment for you? Or no, because at the end of the day, as you guys experience. We have to trust each other, mm. right? You trust each other in a scene. You trust each other. You trust the, the special effects. Mm. And, you know, a lot of that stuff, even how we shot it, you know, the red team, blue team, all of that was invented. Mm. And it was invented by these great department heads and harnessed by guided by all of us all of us had a collaborative nature to the filmmaking even even the the actors were talking to the men i mean my favorite story is on 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 the medic that episode there was a patrol right on that patrol we have the, the scenes, we have the call sheet, and the guys show up, and there are three other guys that show up all in webbing and costume and makeup and armed, and they say, I spoke to my guy last night, and he said I was on that patrol. You don't have to give me any lines. I just have to be on it because my guy said I was on that patrol. 
Mm. That's the kind of collaboration and dedication that everybody, and that meant that you had to go to the webbing guy and the costume, even though you weren't on the call sheet, right? Mm. They did it mm. because you it was important. Mm. This, and this kind of leads us nicely onto boot camp. Uh, so obviously it, it you know it happened to a lesser extent on, on <laughs> saving private Ryan a couple of days, but what were the concerns and how was that really thought out? Because obviously Dale died. Did he just come to you with a plan? There must have been concerns sending 30 actors just weeks before filming on a 10-day. You know, I mean, there's no sort of health and safety here. We all had to sort of pile in. What what were your concerns and issues around that time? What kind of discussions did you have? We, we were always concerned about safety. We were always concerned about the idea of actors. And guns. Basically doing, <laughs> <laughs> you know, basically doing, you know, training. Yeah. Soldier training, right? Um and playing with, even though it was blanks, real, real, you know, ammo and and guns and all of that stuff, weapons, I should say. I'll I'll get yeah, be careful. Them. You're gonna have to do push-ups if you say. <laughs> yeah, I know <laughs> weapons. Um, uh, and and you know, living living outside in the in in the rough with MREs and and all of that that real experience. But Dale had proved himself uh, capable of doing that with, with the actors on Saving Private Ryan. And so we had to trust that. And Tom trusted him and Stephen trusted him. And we had a lot of discussions with Dale about it. But in the end, we all make a leap of faith. Mm. And I think for me, and I think for Tom and Stephen, this idea of rehearsal is what boot camp really was because you guys were in boot camp as your characters, even as you were learning all of the logistics uh, and all of the skill sets needed to be a, as to be a soldier, right? Um, you, it was a, a valuable period of rehearsal. The dynamics were formed, uh, those character dynamics, those character relationships. There was an inkling of, there was a sense of what that would be in combat. Yeah. And that's why it was important. Dexter Fletcher called it 10 days of 24 hours a day improv, which I thought. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, yeah. 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 that's exactly it. But it, it helped you develop those relationships under those conditions, which had you not been in those conditions, it would have just been rehearsal in, mm. you know, on a stage, yeah. which is different than the mud, the exhaustion, the mm. sleeplessness, the fear, the, you know, all of the things that a soldier goes through. Well, I'll tell you this, Tony, I, cause I live, um, <clears throat> I live up in the North of England um, near, where the British Army in the North are based. So I bump into a lot of soldiers, I bump into a lot of active soldiers, uh, things like in the sauna, and then they'll be like, I oh, know you don't, we get, we get talking about band. And the minutiae that these guys pick up on, like when we're on patrol, everyone's got their rifle on, on alert, on guard, do you know what I mean? And nobody, yeah. not even the guys at the far end of the arrowhead, I've got their rifles down, everyone's on alert. They notice stuff like that. They notice yeah. stuff like that, and it's important to them. And it just got drummed into us in boot camp, you know. Yeah. If you weren't on guard, somebody's going to, Freddie Joe's going to come and stick your head in the dirt. you got to do 30 push-ups and that's that. Yeah. But, it, yeah. but it was so valuable to be, because I remember, you know, many times when there would be a, uh, there would be a sequence being shot and I'm not in it. You know, I've got no lines, I'm not mentioned in it, but I'm, I'm on set and they'll be like, well, you know, this is downtime, you've just had a battle, what would you be doing? And boot camp taught us all of that. Well, I'll be, you know, I'm a gunner, uh, gunner assistant, so I'll be cleaning the weapon, I'll be checking ammo, I'll be getting ammo from other guys, I'll be getting a brew. Do you know what I mean? We we all yeah. so we all did all this stuff without being yeah. told what to do or do it. We just knew what we were doing at the time, and that all came from boot camp. Yeah, relentlessly shining shoes as well. As I remember. Well, guys, <laughs> you you know this. 
when you watch a movie, when you watch a series that can create a seamless world, a seamless reality, mm -hmm. that's when you believe you're in it, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at my favorite movie, The Godfather, there isn't a false note or a false moment in it. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's 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 what you guys achieved on Ben. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a false movement. There wasn't a false note. Everybody believed what you were doing because you had experienced it in boot camp to mm -hmm. some degree. Mm -hmm. And then you applied it to the scenes themselves. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't, you know, even if it wasn't the scene, like you said, Doug, if, if it wasn't the scene that that was focused on you and you were just in the background, you knew yeah. what your character was doing at that moment. You were living that character on yeah. screen. Yeah. And that's that's what made it special. Yeah. Um, you directed episode eight. Yeah. Um, I, I did so many rumors swirl around. I was in the show. I know people in the show. I even like the myths just keep spiraling out of how you got started for a start, uh, which I was wrong about. Um, we there is a rumor that that Stephen was supposed to direct that episode and got sick. Is that is that do you want to myth bust that or is that true? Yeah, no, that Stephen wasn't ever going to direct an episode. Um, and I had ended up doing eight because it was the last one right and as you know i was prepping all of the show and prepping with all of the directors and so it, it only made sense if i was going to direct at all to direct the last episode right in the schedule yeah and that's why i ended up doing eight um there was on the pacific a director who couldn't make it and that's when i had to jump in and direct that episode because I was going to again direct the last episode but that episode that I directed was actually in the middle of the schedule and one of the directors had a, a family emergency and so I ended up jumping in and directing that episode wow okay that's probably the conflation yeah and, if you see, and then the, like people online say stuff and then you you start to believe it yourself i mean the the rumors just they just go crazy it's mad i, I will say uh Stephen was very involved even to the point of reshoots that we did on some of the episodes and lenses and framing and very involved uh, we we benefited a great deal from steven's direction even if he wasn't on the set well he's quite a good director let's all agree on that <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know that guy I, 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 that steven spielberg guy yeah, yeah. he's done a bit I definitely got the sense remember, he's done it, it was his yeah. language right from yeah. saving private Mother. yeah his cinematic language was what we used and refined and evolved on on band oh right so um, this is a question i was going to ask later but i mean it, it, this is it works really well for me to ask this now so when you guys are prepping the overall look of band was private ryan the chief inspiration or was it stuff like why we fight all john ford stuff or what was the one thing the one sort of melee? i think all of those inspirations that you're talking about john yeah. ford all that that's what inspired Stevens' band. I mean, um, Saving Private Ryan, right? right. He, he had looked at how uh, photographers, cinematographers, war cinematographers, and document documentarians, he had looked at all of that stuff. And that's what influenced and shaped what he saw for Saving Private Ryan. We took everything that he did yeah. And, 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 you know, maybe tweaked it here and there according to what he wanted us to do and evolved it. And that's what you got in band. Mm -hmm. It was, was really uh, influenced by Stephen's cinematic language. And the most important thing I think mm -hmm. that he imparted to us, to me personally, was that <clears throat> It wasn't about the explosions. It wasn't about the action. Stay with the characters. 
So if there's a big explosion here and you miss it because you're with the characters, that's all that matters because you'll see the characters reacting to it. Right? Right. Even if you miss it in the frame, you'll f- catch it right on the edge of the frame. But what's important is you're with the characters in it and you're under the helmet. And that's what we really followed. And that's what you see in band. And you always with the characters. And you as executive producer are fine for them not shooting the 20,000 pound explosion that you just paid for <laughs> on the left. They missed it completely. <laughs> Don't worry, it's fine. It was on the character. But is, yeah. is that... Is that I think the, that's what, but that's that's what is important. No, it's what I said earlier, right? It's you guys that matter. It's not the explosion, the tree, the the big buildings that were blowing up or whatever. It was really always about staying on you guys. Yeah. But do you, do you think that that has attributed? You could attribute that to Band of Brothers' unique and like uh, enduring appeal. Because it seems to be almost more popular now than ever. In some, do you know what I mean? Do you think it's the fact that you that you filmed it with that philosophy of focusing on the characters always? That, well, that, that is yes. that, that is last. Yes, but if you guys didn't film. deliver, it would yeah. fail. Mm. You know, it was you guys that delivered that, right? We could only stay, you can only stay on characters that are interesting, that are always interesting. And you guys were always interesting for us to shoot. Mm. Whatever you were doing, even in the background, you were interesting. Like you said, Mm. you you know, loading animo, you were cleaning weapons, you were, you know, always there was business that was interesting and most important of all, authentic and real. Yeah. You know, one of the things that 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 really when Tom said, let's put the real guys up before the episode, I was I was resistant, but he was right because he had faith in the because for me, the reason I was resistant was. How could we ever match those real guys in the show? But you guys did. Yeah. You made them, you made them come alive. You made them real. You made them feel authentic. And that's why we do that. And Tom had the faith and the vision to do that. The, that happening in every episode and then in episode 10, revealing who they are. They are. Is pretty much the most magical bit in the whole series and i've watched that show with so many people because i i do tours and stuff and normandy and all that kind of stuff and that's the bit that everyone appreciates the most so it wasn't that's a tom. master stroke definitely tom yeah because i remember having that conversation with him going you know we put the real guys in front we might look like cheesy reenactment <laughs> <laughs> how how late in how late in filming did that discussion happen? Had you finished filming then? Was this something in post-production or was that as it was being shot? I think it was definitely something in post-production yeah. because I don't remember if the, if the, if the doc- documentary had been completed yet. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wow. Um, oh, we could just talk about bands till midnight, but I want to, um, I want to get onto the Pacific. Um, yeah. Because we did a bunch of Zoom cast reunions. So we did all the episodes and we had writers and actors and all that kind of stuff on. And then, of course, we ran out of episodes um, because it was only 10. So we got onto the Pacific. And I never actually watched the Pacific before. Um, So I had to for prep. And I watched it once through and I was like, "Mm, okay. And then I watched it second time through and I was like, okay, this is freaking brilliant. And then I watched it a third time through and I was like, this is an absolute masterpiece. Um, but we'll begin at the beginning. When did, when did the Pacific come to the front and, and how did that come about? Was it just a natural progression or was Dale Dye knocking on your door going, we got to do the Marines, dude. We got to do the Marines. Um, I, I think it was something that was bubbling around for a while because it, it, wasn't, it wasn't until, I don't know, six, seven years later than Ban that we did the Pacific. There was always this, this, you know, 
the obvious fear is uh, we don't want to do band where the guys are just sweating. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> sweaty band. <laughs> So what was it that was going to define the Pacific and what was the reason to do it, I think, was the question. What are we exploring? If Ben was the celebration of the greatest generation and the sacrifices these, that these men made, but it was a celebration of them, right, of their journey and their, their the, 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 the human the human spirit overcoming such adversity. What was the Pacific going to be about? And and what what was the conclusion? Like, did you what was the sort of the through line for that? What was the the philosophy behind that to make it different? As you said, yeah. what was the? If you think about Banner Brothers, the title says it all, and you yeah. experience that. It was yeah. this brotherhood it was this camaraderie that you know held each other up even through the lowest point for each individual for the pacific what we really wanted to explore was the the individual cost right if you think about that scene of sledge at the end not being able to hunt anymore mm. with his father that's the cost right the loss of Baz alone to his family the cost that, that he cost him his life mm. what does it cost his family and what does it cost it is the individual cost of war mm. that's what we really want to explore and that cost is psychological and so you think about some of the stuff that Timmy Van Patten did on that show and it is pretty horrific and dark because mm. that is the cost of war. You see that, you experience that darkness, that that horror. Mm. And how did, um, just for you personally, how did uh, the two shows compare? Just just what, what was different in production? I mean, other than it being- uh, Well, I'll, I'll give you the main difference. Yeah. We didn't have the guys. You guys did the real guys, right? They talking to you guys, they they were talking to most of the cast. Were talking to the people who they were playing, mm. and that's a big difference for us. Yeah, no, it is. It really is. What yeah. I am. Do you think that that it was less? I don't know. I don't want to. <laughs> was it less sort of grounded then? Do you know what I mean? In the in the real guys or. I don't you know, know you are shooting in Australia and we didn't have, and it was in the middle of the writer's strike in 2008. <laughs> and we were far away from Tom and Stephen. And there, you know, Tom directed an episode of Ban. Mm -hmm. They were so close to us during band, as well as the real guys. And I think that's, there's a, there's a magic to that, mm -hmm. right? And there was this, this responsibility that you guys all felt because the guys were there yeah. and the guys were alive. And that's, that's just a different thing. It's not that the actors were better or worse or less or more committed. It's just different. Mm -hmm. And we were exploring something that was far darker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We spoke to Bruce McKenna about that. He was, that was his, yeah. that was his I mean, just think about it. It's a band of brothers. It's a brotherhood. It's a different exploration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, we've had Pacific cast members on on our podcast and on our zoom and uh, i just need to hear it from the exec producer which one of our boot camps was tougher because i'm pretty sure it was ours but they reckon, <laughs> they reckon it was theirs tony oh we lost him we might have lost tony for a second there 
I think he's ducked out that question, of which was the... Oh, oh he's, he's just joining us. Hang on a second. Can you, can you hear us, Tony? Sorry, I, I lost you because my, my computer crashed. Tony, oh, okay. you, you ducked out the most important question so far. We've had the we've had the band guys on, we've had the Pacific guys on, and there's a big argument as to who, which one of our boot camps was the toughest. We know it was ours. They think it was theirs. We need the exec producer <laughs> to tell us finally <laughs> that the band guys had a tougher boot camp. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think that the band guys had a different boot camp than the Pacific in that there was a real concentration on that kind of uh, connection that was important to band. Mm -hmm. And on the Pacific, there was less of that brotherhood. Um, and they were in Australia which has many more creatures that can kill you in many more ways. <laughs> so that that's a different scary problem. Right. But I think the intensity of Dale Dye was dialed up more on band than right. it was. Yes. Right, yeah. I'll claim, I'll claim that so let's just, yeah, just for our listeners and any Pacific cast members who may be listening, Band of Brothers boot camp was tougher. That's it. <laughs> no, no, no. We've just got it from the head honcho. Um, so now, if you don't want me asking, um, you moved over to Disney, Tony. Yes. What is your role there? Um, I was, you know, for the first time in my career, I took an executive job. And it was really educational and eye-opening and... The people at Disney were fantastic and I was very, very lucky and I thought I'd only be there for a couple of years. And I ended up staying there for 10 years doing various things for them. They are a, a fantastic company um, and the people there are great. And it was for, I was in the, in the movie division, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so I was head of physical production. Um, Sean Bailey was the president of production and he was a friend and he, he, he was instrumental in getting me there. But once there, I thought I was going to leave and I ended up doing a couple of years at Lucas and then doing like um, three or four years uh, working on, on um, China. So I was there for a total of about 10 years. And it was a really great experience that taught me so much about the business that I didn't know about, right? I, I had only functioned as a, as a producer, as a creative producer. Uh, and the perspective of the business was really given to me by doing that, by being at Disney. They're really smart guys there. And I learned a lot. And you left there and you went back to being a hitman for the mob. So we've come full circle. Yeah, full yeah, circle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, before I let you go, Tony, because it's been absolutely fantastic. Um, <clears throat> we subhead. We subhead our podcast. We call ourselves the Nearly Men. Um, so anybody who comes on here, we get them to tell a story of something they could nearly have been. Um, could you nearly have been a lawyer or a carpenter? Um, it sounds like you've had every job in Christendom anyway, so I'm not <laughs> sure you have <laughs> a nearly story. But was there one point, I guess, if you'd have married the actress, you could have gone a different way. Was there any job that you were just like, I could have been, I could have been the executive producer of this, or I could have directed that, or there's like one, one thing that stands out for you. Don't tell well, me mentioned, he meant, you mentioned pre med at, right at the top of the show. So. Oh, yeah. What was that? <laughs> you know, uh, I'm a good Asian son who uh -huh. was pre med. And then, and then I met the actress, and that was that. And now um, you're a bad Asian son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I could have been um, the first 
Asian in the Italian mob. <laughs> yes, you could. <laughs> yes, you could. Don Toe. <laughs> Don Toe. <laughs> Don Toe. Don Toe. It's all very better call Saul. I love it. <laughs> well, listen, Tony, we've had you for 45 minutes. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Ivan for paving the way as well. It's been an absolute pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Lovely seeing you guys. Um, you know, it is a brotherhood and all of you mean that much to me. Okay, Papa. Well, we'll see you at Michael Cutlets' barbecue pretty soon. Yes. See you then. See you then. Take care, Tony. Thank you. Well. Thank you. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye. Wow. Top fella. That was fascinating, wasn't it? Yeah. That, that really was, was fascinating. What a lovely guy. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. I just, I know he's still got the little glint in his eye that he, he had. He's he like does, doesn't he? Yeah, he's yeah. Like a child giving big toys to play with, but he plays with them sensibly. Yeah, yeah that's lovely. Really that cool. took me right back. Yeah, just seeing his face again after all these years, you know, just kind of still takes got, you back, doesn't it? Still got the cheeky smile, yes. He um, does. Yeah. I'll go back now to the We Happy Few crew, and there is a shout out I need to do from the tour. Uh, that we just did in Normandy, uh, and that is to Brianna, because <laughs> uh, I lost a bet to Brianna about which one of us would see the coast first. It's one of those things where you're on a bus and uh, you're like a bunch of kids, and I bet her I would see the sea first. And she said she would see the sea first. Uh, and it spiralled, and um, whoever saw the sea first was allowed to kick the other one in the pants as hard as they could. <laughs> I nodded out on the bus on the way to the landing beaches. And when I got there, she was just looking at me like, I definitely saw it first. I know you were asleep. But she took the high road. She's the better person. And she didn't kick me in the pants, which, if you know, Browner is actually really quite a step up. Uh, she grew, <laughs> her heart grew three sizes that day. And so, Brianna, thank you very, very much for that. <laughs> one pet peeve um it's not mine um and that is uh <laughs> people flying drones low overhead when the historian is talking um we've had a couple of pet peeves about that it's all in good jest as we know who the people are flying the drones over but the next time i am going to bring a tennis racket and smack it straight out of the sky like a rogue wasp just so you know just to make people happy uh, other than that do you have any peeves or anything dougie um nothing at the moment that i can think of i will think about it though and have a few next week i do I tell you i do i am starting <laughs> no tomorrow i'm actually going to german well like school like actually going to in-person classes starting tomorrow four days a week wow this is my last attempt to learn the language so uh, i've joined uh, a school that's in um in in uh, near boxhagener platz which is in uh, um prenzlauberg or Fried- no friedrichstein and uh, signed up it's a month a 1.1 which is like the beginner beginner because i have ceased to learn anything um so I'm, i'll start that tomorrow i'm a little bit nervous originally i signed up because they were going to do it online so they were going to do it online but with a live teacher right so it'd be a live class and but then they emailed me yes just yesterday and said we don't have enough enough subscribers so you either can wait another month or you can do the in-person one which is kind of what i wanted to avoid so tomorrow i will be in a class with 11 other people um trying desperately hard to not make a fool of myself and that's not going to happen is it i am going to be please know. tell me that you have seen the spongebob episodes where he's taking driver's ed at school or he is his driving teacher trying to teach him how to drive and he just keeps driving all of them insane he's failed failed his driver's ed like three thousand times or something <laughs> It's, it's what it reminds me of. It's so funny. <laughs> so what you're saying to me is, is that I will be doing German A1.1 
every month for the next six months instead of going up. Yeah, it will be. What well, are you trying to intimate that it's going to be a disaster? No, I'm, I'm, I've got nerve. I'm actually nervous about it. It's I like it starts at three. It's three till six. So it's only three hours, thank God, or three and a bit hours. And um, yeah, I don't put any more pressure on you. I just, uh, I just uh, it reminds me of the SpongeBob episode. That's all. <laughs> well, I'm very glad that I remind you of of that of uh, of uh, you know a cartoon where the character cannot learn anything ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much it. an enormous amount of faith. <laughs> <laughs> I am a dick. I know. Such a shit bug. Um, right. Well, we'll wind it up there. We'll wind it up there. I'll say thank you to all our listeners. I don't know if he's listening, but JD, if this message gets to you, I'm really, really sorry, man, that you've had all your footage nicked in Normandy, uh, from Normandy. Who's this? It's a very high level YouTuber who was on our tour and he did all this really cool footage and it got nicked, I think, in Athens. Um, Oh, no. I don't know someone nicked his gear, I guess, and he had all this really cool stuff. Um, from a purely mercenary point of view, he was giving us a bunch of shout outs as well, but that's not why I'm bringing this up. Um, I just think it's really, really sad. I think he's going to have to go back there and shoot a bunch of stuff, but I feel really sorry for you, man. Um, that's yeah, a really so crappy thing to have happen to you. And he's yeah. a really good dude as well. Really good dude. Yeah. Sorry about that, fellas. Anyway, don't want to bring it down. That's a great podcast. So um, we'll just thank everyone for listening. I thank our Patreons and we'll keep trying to bring you cool guests. Not sure if we can get one cooler than that, but we'll keep endeavouring to try. All right, guys. Thanks very much for listening and we'll catch you next week. See you next week. Cheers.